Welcome to Eat Blog Talk, where food bloggers come to get their fill of the latest tips, tricks, and insight into the world of food blogging. If you feel that hunger for information, we'll provide you with the tools you need to add value to your blog, and we'll also ensure you're taking care of yourself because food blogging is a demanding job. Now, please welcome your host, Megan Porta. Are you a motivated food blogger striving to meet financial or freedom goals? If so, then the Eat Blog Talk membership is for you. Take a journey with like-minded peers that will bring you past the overwhelm and straight into the arms of clarity. You will have direct access to guest experts delivering massive amounts of value into your business. You will have the opportunity to participate in monthly strategy calls, focusing on different aspects of food blogging, and most importantly, you will be part of a tight-knit, supportive, and encouraging family filled with people just like you. Visit eatblogtalk.com for more information, and the rest of us cannot wait to see you inside. Okay, what is up, food bloggers? Welcome to Eat Blog Talk. This podcast is for you, food bloggers wanting value and clarity to help you find greater success in your business. Today, I am going to have a conversation with Samantha Milner from RecipeThis.com, and we are going to chat about food blogging success without perfect photography. Samantha is a six-figure food blogger over at RecipeThis.com with her chef husband, Dominic. They focus on cooking with kitchen gadgets such as the air fryer, instant pot, bread machine, slow cooker, soup maker, and blender. Samantha, I am super excited to talk to you today about photography and everything else. Some web accessibility we'll throw in there. But first, we want to hear your fun fact. My fun fact would be in the summer of 2018, I said to my husband, for the same price that it would cost for two weeks at Disney World, I said, I bet I can do us eight weeks traveling around Europe in a tent. We did eight beautiful European countries in the, in a tent. Um, thanks to um, PR knowledge, I managed to get the tent and all the camping gear for free. And we did all of our cooking during those eight weeks in the instant pot pressure cooker. Oh my gosh, that is an amazing story and super inspiring. With a little bit of knowledge, you can definitely take traveling a long way, right? So that's super, super cool. I'm kind of jealous, actually. <laughs> cool. Well, thanks for sharing that, Samantha. Um, we're, today, we're going to talk about photography, how it doesn't need to be perfect. You are a shining example of this. And I am notorious for saying that photography does need to be good in order to find success. I say that all the time. So I am open to hearing your take and I'm really excited to dive into that. But first, I just want to touch on your story because you are a partially sighted food blogger and you have, I mean, obviously found success food blogging. So I would love just to hear a little bit about your story and also what your take is on the whole web accessibility topic. Well, I originally started my first food blog back in 2009 before they were trendy and before a lot of people had jumped on the food blogging bandwagon. And my husband, as you've mentioned, is a chef or was a chef. And we enjoyed it. But at the time, our business model was website flipping. So we were uh, building up blogs and then selling them for profit. So that was our first taste of it. And we'd also had a kitchen gadget site that specialized in reviewing bread machines, soup machines, etc. And we did lots and lots of different sites, managed sites for clients and realized that what we loved the most was kitchen gadgets and food blogging. So eventually in 2015, we kind of came back full circle. Um, Regarding my eyesight, uh, my uh, my mum, when she was um, in childbirth with me, um, there was complications and I had a stroke during childbirth. And this um, affected the part of the brain that does your eyesight and also gave me epilepsy. So I've always worked online because nobody wants you in the real world when you're partially sighted because... They just don't, you know, it's so hard to find a job. And 
I seeked online work because I couldn't get one in the real world. And as a partially sighted blogger, it's not that difficult. I think the biggest difficulty was recently myself and my husband were needing to upgrade our laptops. And I think we ended up on the fourth one before it was suitable for me because I think the first one, the screen was way too bright and it was setting off my epilepsy. The second one he bought me, um, the screen was too small for me for when I'm increasing the font size to the accessibility that I need. And it just became this long and winded thing just to get a laptop. But apart from that, on a day to day basis, uh, I'm not that bad. Um, from a web um, accessibility point of view for myself, what I find a nightmare is um, on a lot of sites, you're now told to make your font size really big, um, you know, to be able to earn more from Mediavine and AdThrive and whatnot. Well, my site font is already too big. So quite often this knocks a lot of the text off the screen. But the biggest issue I have, which is more because I've got epilepsy, is that when I'm viewing um, a page, I can't handle GIFs. And, you know, how often do you see a GIF on a site? If I'm subscribed to a newsletter and they send me a GIF, I will unsubscribe because it's just too much of a health risk for me to uh, view emails with them in. Oh, wow. That is something I never would think about. And I appreciate your perspective so much because you know, we just get used to living life as we are and as we know it. So I really appreciate you bringing this perspective to the table because I don't think most people think of that. So yeah, yeah, just thank you for sharing that. I, I really appreciate all of that. Well, I met um, this wonderful lady. Uh, she lives in um, Nashville in the United States and she is completely blind and she um, she's an avid user of the Instant Pot, and that's how I met because she became one of our subscribers, and the friendship's grown over the years. And what always inspired me about her is that she actually teaches other people to use the Instant Pot. Yet there's so many people that have still got the Instant Pot sat in the box, and a blind person is there showing other blind people how to use it, and that always fascinates me. And the one feedback she always gave me when it came to accessibility, because she sends me really, really long emails, which is obviously using audio to be able to achieve that. And she always says to me that the worst thing is the fast YouTube videos. So we're talking the recipe videos we have with the, just the hands and pans and the music. And that is her nightmare because with the music playing, she has no idea what's going on. You know, so I've recently started doing YouTube videos and I'm making sure that I'm really, really descriptive so that people that are partially sighted or blind can listen along and still follow the recipes. Oh, I love hearing that, too. And that is actually a change I made in my own videos. We're not creating a ton of videos right now, but we went from doing like the music and hands and pans to voiceover so that something substantial is actually being said about the recipe. Like I'll just give kind of tips about the pan I'm using or ingredients or something because I had that in my mind. Like what if someone, can't, you know, can't see this and they're just like, oh, it says like music playing. OK, great. But what else is going on? So another great perspective. So thanks for sharing that. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd ne I must admit, I'd never I'd never thought about the, that all those years ago until she said it to me you know it's it's not something that's really in your mind until someone brings that to your attention and then you're like oh and then you start to think about things a little bit differently so thank you for sharing all of that samantha super awesome stuff there and very inspiring um I would love to talk to you about photography I'm so curious to hear your take on this because you have a different perspective than I do about photography but I'm always willing to see other points of view. So first of all, what do you use to take the photos for your blog? 
Um, I currently use um, an iPhone 11 Pro Max. I've been using that for, I think, about a year now. And my husband has just purchased the iPhone 12. So now when we do videos, we felt that one was not enough. You know, it's like you want to do the front angle and you want to do the hands and pans. So um, his 12 is the one now that does kind of my uh, face in the videos. And then my 11 Pro Max is the one that's attached to the tripod. But before that, I was using just the iPhone 7. But right back when I started Recipe This, I was under the opinion, like everybody else, that you have to have top-notch photography, otherwise nobody's ever going to be interested in your recipes. Well, uh, I did that. I hired someone to take photos for me. I would uh, show them my recipe, give them it, the details, and then they would produce the photos for me. I found out later that they were just actually using stock photos. So I have a massive bunch of stock photos on my site from when I started in 2015 uh, through to the end of 2017, which is a real bummer. And then we started taking our own photos in the beginning of 2018. We started off like most people where we got ourselves a digital camera. Um, I couldn't tell you what it was. I just know it was a Canon. And uh, my husband would take the photos. And, you know, it just, I just wanted to do the photos. And they just didn't feel right. And I said to my husband, can we switch to the iPhone instead? Because the iPhone doesn't take terrible pictures either, so we thought we'll give that a go instead. And we moved to using iPhones, I think, in 2019. And we found that um, in the beginning, obviously, the, uh, the photos were much better than what we're producing now. And what we've actually found is that we get a much higher social share now. People prefer um the kind of the girl next door they're wanting the home cook photos rather than the Gordon Ramsay which I'm not knocking anybody that's fantastic at food photography here but you know uh, a lot of the time people just want something quick and easy and because my my niche that I'm in is the instant pot and the air fryer people are more interested in seeing it coming together in the instant pot on the air fryer rather than four or five different um, featured images or hero shots of the food. And I found that I've got a lot of feedback and people prefer it that way. That's really interesting. So quality needs to be a part of the equation on some level. I believe that. So if you are not focusing on photography quality, are you just putting all of your focus on the actual process and the recipe and the way that people can recreate your recipe in a quality way? Yes, yes. I'm all about user experience. Uh, that's my number one goal. And, you know, I'm focusing on having the best recipes, having the best write up on the post, being the person that my readers can come to whenever they need me, whenever they need help with a recipe. And it's just um, done really well that way. I, I still get um, great Pinterest traffic, um, great Google traffic, great Facebook traffic. And I've... Um, I've not focused on photography as much as some others do. You know, I focused on the quality of the recipe first, um, good writing, good customer support, you know, rather than just the photography. And some of our pictures are a lot better than others. There's some of them that look really bad. <laughs> and then there's others. <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, you cannot tell the difference between that and a digital camera on some of them. But that also comes down to the fact that we live in a very old house. It's got one very high up window. They, it's very dark in there. And, you know, even our digital camera photos that we took weren't great on the light. And the other thing is 
with using our cameras is we can use all the iPhone editing apps and it makes us a lot quicker get in the process in getting the photos ready and the recipe ready and getting it to our reader quicker. So tell me about your Pinterest thoughts and your strategy because Pinterest is an entirely visual platform and you don't have your recipe. The recipe isn't the first thing people are seeing. So they don't know that your recipe is quality. So if your photos aren't quality, like you said that some of them were not, some of them are. If you have a photo on Pinterest that is not, how do you explain that you're pulling people in and through to your site? I think a lot of it is because for us, we are, we're very original. You know, it's we're the ones that seem to create new things in the Instant Pot and Air Fry niche. And then we get a lot of copycats after that. So often on Pinterest, because ours is the first, it's getting lots of shares before other people have even created it. So, you know, we're not in a position where we're competing with lots of people as much at first. So we're getting the traction. You know, and sometimes it's just the fact that people love to see on Pinterest the before and after. One of our uh, popular pins on Pinterest is for air fryer steak. And it's got a top image, a bottom image and the text in between. And the before image is showing it raw going in the air fryer and the bottom image is it cooked done. So people can imagine what the food's going to be like they can visualize what the end result's going to be for them and they can say that it's easy to achieve for themselves if they're an air fryer beginner yeah that makes sense I like that I like that how you describe that and then you mentioned creating new things and you guys do a lot of original recipes that maybe aren't scattered all over Pinterest already can you give me some examples about that and also how do you come up with your recipe ideas Oh, I've been using the air fryer now for almost 10 years. It'll be 10 years next month since we got our first. So we've had a lot more practice than most have had with it. And, you know, I'm just cooking something in the kitchen. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, that would be great. And before I know it, I've kind of done another recipe for something else. Like last weekend, I was supposed to be going in the kitchen to do two recipes. I left with eight. I, I don't know how that happened. I just kind of thought, oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And it's like it's like my brain's overloaded with ideas and I just, I just can't really explain it. And um, for some of the recipes I did first, um, I was the first to do instant pot meatloaf. And come on, there's been, how many of them has there been now? Um, I was the first to do air fryer corn on the cob and that's a great example because that picture was probably one of the worst I've ever done. And it was taken on my iPhone and I just got all these new editing apps and I was trying them all out. And, you know, I'd made the corn on the cob too bright. It, you know, I think I'd oversaturated it. It had gone bright orange. It looked absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> and, you know, um, it it brings in 30,000 visitors a month from uh, Pinterest, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And then another one that we did, which we were the first to do, uh, which loads of people have done, which I will say now before I tell you the recipe name, that it actually does look like sick on a plate. It just looks disgusting. It looks really, really bad. And I don't know what I was thinking about. And I think that went out in 2018. And that was for instant pot beef tips and gravy. You know, it's just the way that the gravy's landed on top of the mashed potatoes. It just looks really bad. And it's not necessarily the photography part of it. I'm really bad at food styling as well. I really do suck at food styling. But uh, that's my second highest pin on Pinterest for traffic. Wow. I know. Well, that's crazy, <laughs> but that's a testament to what you're saying. Um, what are your thoughts about doing a roundup post, so compiling information from other bloggers that you then circulate through Pinterest? Um, that was That's actually my most successful uh, pin is a roundup I did. It was called 101 Instant Pot Recipes for Beginners. 
I now even have an affiliate program for it that other instant pot bloggers promote. And when I originally started it, the idea was that I suck at photography. If I can get a lot of different bloggers in on it and, you know, use their amazing photography as, uh, as a way to get Pinterest traffic, you know, rather than relying on your own rubbish photography, uh, then it would be a great, great way to grow. I'm, I'm thinking at the time we just uh, hit about 150,000 page views a month back then. And it was going to be, in my idea, um, of great growth. And Instant Pot had just taken off at the time. So it was the top dog that everybody was talking about. I'm talking beginning of 2017. And what I did is I featured a lot of different bloggers, different level bloggers, kind of your beginners that were getting um, similar traffic to myself, to those that were getting over a million page views a month. And what I did is I found lots of amazing photos and then some that were at my level and a, bit, a little bit in between. And I made sure that every image was pinned on Pinterest. And I also shared them on Pinterest groups at the time. And I emailed out everybody that I'd featured and they all shared it. And I was very lucky because the bigger bloggers shared it too. So that gave me um, a brilliant, um, quick viral pin. Um, and I think in um, the space of 60 days, it had 300,000 shares. It just went crazy. Wow, that's amazing. So how, what's your process for that? Do you reach out to bloggers ahead of time? Do you just do it and then tell them after? I, I reached out because obviously you're asking for people's permission to use the photos. So I, uh, I reached out first. I kind of planned the um, areas that I wanted to cover because obviously I was doing a big roundup. So I kind of planned that I wanted to do lots of chicken, potatoes, eggs, and so on for my uh, different H2 headings. And then I looked for everyone that I wanted to include. And then I preliminarily wrote in my, in my Word document who was included. And I highlighted them all in pink that I was waiting for permission to include. And as soon as I got the permission back, I took the pink off to know that they were okay to be used. And I also had a spreadsheet and that had their name, email address, social media handles and that kind of thing. And I made sure each of them got a personal email from myself when the uh, roundup went live. And I encouraged them to share it on Pinterest and Facebook. And we also got a lot of shares on Facebook as well. And, you know, a lot of those bloggers that featured us and made the effort we then made sure that next time we were doing a roundup they got priority for, to be included you know because you want to build up that kind of list so that when you're doing a roundup you're getting the shares from other people rather than uh, just worrying that nobody's going to share it that you've featured and that's how I did it and I think at the time, because I didn't have that many Instant Pot recipes myself, I think out of the 101, 30 of them were my own and the rest of them were all reached out from other people. All right. Thank you for talking through that. That's really helpful. And I think a very smart strategy. Um, you touched a little bit before on your before and after photos and how people respond to that. What do you think about using step-by-step -step photos, like process shots for Pinterest pins? I find that um, what I tend to do is I tend to do three main pins that I put on Pinterest these days. Kind of uh, my featured one that's at the top of my post that's got the title of the recipe and then what you call a hero shot. Then I have um, a four-in-one that, uh, that includes the four main steps of the recipe. And then right at the bottom of my post, I have what I call a skinny, which is um, before and after. 
And even though I always share all three, each time I bring out a new recipe, I always find that the one that gets the most shares is the um, step-by-step. Interesting. I'm looking at your Pinterest uh, account right now and just looking to see how you do some of that. So you find that the ones with all of the step-by-step are definitely the most fruitful. Yes. And I think that um, people are now getting um, more clued up on what food blogs are and what they like about them. And I get so many um, so many emails back saying thank you for the step-by-step and that they hate it when it's just a different angle, the same finished dish throughout and that they want the step-by-step so that they can understand how to do the recipe. It makes it more approachable, right? I mean, like you said earlier, it was like, um, I don't remember exactly your wording, but like this highly curated photo isn't like super approachable for everybody. But if you see a raw piece of meat on a cutting board with some vegetables that you just chopped, that is something that people can relate to because that is what's happening in their kitchen. Yes, I think that if your niche is uh, more aimed towards the dinner parties crowd, you know, or five-star hotel kind of food, I think the uh, photography does need to be absolutely amazing. But I think for the average home cook, they don't really need or want that. They want to be able to get dinner on the table quickly you know, the, the working mom that's just got 20 minutes to cook dinner in the Instant Pot, she wants to know how much liquid to add to the pasta and what it looks like in the Instant Pot, not a wonderful, pretty bowl of macaroni cheese at the end. You know, she wants that kind of thing. And we have um, a much older audience, mainly. We have a lot of 80-something-year-olds that are retired um often widowed, often with arthritis, they don't have long to stand up and they like the fact that we can show them how to quickly get dinner cooked in the air fryer and then they're off the feet and relaxing again. Oh, that's, I love that you have that audience. I've never heard anyone say that before, but that makes total sense to me how you need to just provide all of those steps, including steps in the photos Um, I want to hear how you got featured on The Kitchen. There's a story behind this. Can you share with us? Uh, Yes, I can. Uh, I love this, actually. It really made me smile. Um, I I hate it when I see recipes in my industry um, that I feel the hiding, the fact that they're harder to do than what what is suggested or that they're just using um, finished photos and you're not seeing the effort that goes into the dish or if the dish is obtainable for the average home home cook. So I'd noticed that there'd been a few mentioned for air fry popcorn and some of my readers have said, can I do this? So I I said to my husband, Dominic, because I thought it's better coming from a chef, um, make us some air fry popcorn, please, darling. So he did. And we all were stood around the air fryer watching, thinking this isn't going to be good. <laughs> and um, we took all the photos and the popcorn actually tasted amazing. And then what I also did is I took pictures of the inside of the air fryer and published them on the same post to show that there was a few of the um, popcorn bits stuck to the air, fr- air vents of the air fryer. Obviously, it was a quick clean and the air fryer was fine and it didn't blow up or anything like this. But I often, I noticed that on the other air fryer uh, sites that have featured popcorn, they haven't disclosed this fact. And I think it's quite scary that you could end up with your food blowing off and whatnot. So in that post, I actually have a section on the recipe that says, behind the scenes uh, pictures of what your inside of your air fryer looks like after you do the air fryer popcorn. And um, the kitchen picked up on this uh, and they published a post on different ways to cook popcorn. And they linked back to us and mentioned um, how risky it can actually be in the air fryer um, and said about our pictures that we had, you see. So 
it was nice to show that not everything is perfectly cooked in the air fryer and there's just a few things that are really not aimed at the air fryer beginner. I love that story. That's such a cool story. You were being real. You were showing exactly what happened where maybe some other bloggers would be like, oh, I'm not going to mention that um, maybe on purpose or not on purpose even. But yeah, that's really cool that the kitchen picked up on that and included your article. So very, very cool. Um, okay, you have this thought, this belief, uh, Samantha, that you just need to be better than your competition. And I kind of agree with that. Let's hear what you have to say about it, though. Well, you know, I've always thought this, um, but it was... Um it was when somebody was talking to me about uh, averages, you know, and how if we're just above average, then, you know, we've got a career. You know, you don't have to be the best in the class to be good at maths, for example. And what I've noticed is that if I was a gourmet uh, food blogger, I wouldn't survive because you've, everybody's photos is perfect in that in that niche. But I take the air fry niche and I have to admit there's a lot of terrible, terrible photos. There's some that are a lot worse than my own. And um, there's a lot of them that actually copy my photography style. And I'm like, well, I'm not good at photography and you're copying on me, you know. Um, like, for example, I started this thing where when I was cooking Instant Pot vegetables, I would do a fork shot. Because I got a complaint once saying that uh, broccoli can't possibly be cooked in that time frame. So I took a picture of it on a fork when I updated the post just to prove that it was. And then I started doing that whenever I did instant pot vegetables. And people loved it because they could then see how it was cooked. And, you know, the fork test is what a lot of us do in the kitchen anyway, isn't it? When we're like boiling our vegetables. You know, so I started doing that and then there'd be copycats of that. And I also noticed that as long as you're you're above average, you've got fantastic chance for growth, you know, because there's a lot of readers out there and want something simple and straightforward that's easy for them to follow along at home. And, you know, as long as you as long as you are better um, above average like if you were at school you would be happy um, with a B rather uh, rather than a C you know you you'd be satisfied with that you know and photography is just one small element of food blogging you know um, the writing is important the quality of the recipes is important you know I'm uh, I'm married to a chef. I've got a chef helping me cook these recipes, you know, and that seems to carry a lot more clout than, say, being uh, better at photography. Yeah, I see your point. I mean, when you use the grade analogy in school, <laughs> yeah, getting a B is fine when you're comparing it to getting a C. Even getting a C is fine when you're comparing getting it to a D, right? As long as you're putting your quality elsewhere, so you're making sure that you're recipes are quality and that you're delivering them in an honorable way and all of that. Like I totally see your point with all of this. And clearly you've made it work. So it's it can happen. Did you have any last thoughts on all of this? I would love to hear anything else you have to say or maybe just like some last takeaways for food bloggers who are in the boat of not having perfect, great, lovely, <laughs> mouthwatering photos, maybe encourage them or give some advice? Well, the thing is, the reason why um, I wanted to talk about it in the first place is I hear that many people that want to start as a food blogger, but they say, I can't do it because I'll never be able to take great photos. You know, it proves that you don't need to have great photos. Just ta take a look on Pinterest and you'll see a lot that are not what I would call A star quality. As long as you could manage a C quality or above, then you're going to do fine. And I think when I started, it was very much big on food gawker and places like that for submitting your photos. Well, that's not as important now. You've got TikTok now where people are putting out really silly low quality videos and you know there's a real market there for the girl next door 
that people can relate to. Yeah, I totally hear you. This has been really eye-opening for me, Samantha. I've really appreciated all of this. Um, yeah, just kind of reframing the way I think about that because as you know, I have, I have a different opinion about Pinterest specifically. And I always tell people, if you want traction on Pinterest, you've got to up your photography game. But you have put a few little strategies into the mix here that have me thinking. So like the step-by-step thing, being more approachable, um, just like maybe lowering yourself to the level that your audience is so that they don't feel um, like they could never possibly make that photo. Yeah. So I really, yeah, I appreciate all of this. Uh, the same, uh, the same rule with Pinterest can actually apply to Facebook as well. Um, we've, we've moved on Facebook to uh, step-by-step photos in our page, in our group. And we found that that has uh, multiplied the reach on our Facebook shares and things as well. So I think people are moving more and more towards wanting the step-by-step photos and to, uh, understand the process a lot more. Super interesting. Thank you, Samantha. Thanks for sharing all about your journey and also what has worked for you and also providing a different perspective for me and for other food bloggers. So I really appreciate your time today. Do you have a favorite quote or words of inspiration to share with us as we wrap up? You know, you said that and I'm thinking to myself, but I've got lots of favorite quotes. How do I choose one? Well, my husband, if he was listening, would be saying, um, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. And I use that one quite a lot. And I also use another one quite a lot, which is to make sure that you stand out from the crowd. That was always my line when I worked in internet marketing. And I believe both of them are very similar. And, you know, a lot of people that are thinking about food blogging, um, will be thinking, I can't do it now because of this, or I can't implement that because my photography is not good enough. We'll just remember there's all this information and help out there for you. And, you know, my photography is better than it was two years ago, but it's still not perfect. And, you know, you can just get in, get involved. And it's an amazing uh, thing that we're all creating with our food blogs. Oh, such wise, encouraging words. I love that. Um, So Samantha, we will put together a show notes page for you, just writing out everything we've talked about. We'll also provide a transcript for the episode. If anyone wants to peek at that, you can go to eblogtalk.com forward slash recipe this. Samantha, remind everyone where they can find you online and on Instagram and all of that. I'm probably about the only food blogger that's not on Instagram. (laughs) Um, But you would find me on Pinterest at forward slash recipe this blog. I'm on uh, Twitter at recipe underscore this. And you can find me on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash recipe this. Awesome. Well, thank you again so much for being here, Samantha. And thank you for listening today, food bloggers. I will see you next time. We're glad you could join us on this episode of Eat Blog Talk. For more resources based on today's discussion, as well as show notes and an opportunity to be on a future episode of the show, be sure to head to eatblogtalk.com. If you feel that hunger for information, we'll be here to feed you on Eat Blog Talk.